Hello from Emerald Hill Skies. My name is Doug Lucas, and we would love to welcome you tonight to this live stream. We do electronically assisted astronomy, and the way it works is we just try to get an image up on our scope. Uh, we put it through a camera. We live stream it to YouTube, and that way you can <clears throat> observe right alongside of us. We can do this together. So what we're going to try to do is um, get things set up here so that I can see the um, stream along with you right here. And in particular, I'm hoping that I can uh, hear what you're going through. Let's see. That doesn't sound right. What in the world is that noise? We go um, trying to get it set up so I can check our audio. But there's something strange going on over here. What is that? Uh, let's see. Um, going to videos. There we are. Make sure our audio is up now. Okay, so I think we're all set. Uh, would you guys, when you get a chance, let us know if this audio is coming through. Okay, Lisa, you're on from Indiana. Great to have you. And uh, Azrae, welcome from Arizona. Mike, uh, you were first tonight, so glad to have you here as well. Uh, let us know if you can hear okay on the audio. There's some kind of a chiming that's happening on my monitor here, but I hope that's just something internal and that's not coming over the live stream. Um, tonight, we're using a, a RASA. Um, it's an 11 inch scope and it's uh, aimed really low on the horizon, right over there where all that Louisville light dome is. We're trying to bring in this. It's uh, NGC 3631. So I'm going to put it up here NGC 3631. And believe it or not, NGC 3631 is that very, very faint galaxy that you see right there in the middle it's so faint that all you can do is barely make out its core i'm trying to figure out how to boost some other signals so we can see more of that galaxy but uh we've read about this in stephen james omira's book steve omira's book uh, which is as we've shared before it's the herschel 400 observing guide and in his book sure enough he says about the only thing you're going to be able to see is the faint, faint core of this galaxy, NGC 3631. It's just two arc minutes wide, and uh, I think it's going to be difficult no matter what. So I think we're going to go ahead and call this, uh, and we're realizing, okay, also it's just, uh, uh, let's see, 12 degrees above the horizon also. So that's a factor as well. Let me just check this. Yeah, 12 degrees when we start observing, so it would be even lower now. So I'm going to say um, very low on the horizon. All we could make out was the faint core. Um, <clears throat> extremely difficult. Part of that is because we're looking at it through several atmospheres. <clears throat> But let's go ahead and save it so at least we've observed it. And then we'll um, maybe come back to it later. Let's go to Maroc's Ghost. So uh, we're going to stop our sequencer here and go to um, next target. And we're going to go to Maroc's Ghost. It says NGC 404. So let's slew there. You can see out there the 11-inch um, Rasa is in our uh, Pure Tech Telestation 2 Observatory. It's on top of a PureTech adjustable height frame. This object's a little bit higher. It's currently at about 29 degrees, so a little bit better off in this case. Uh, you can see the telescope slewing around. The camera that is uh, giving us our view of the scope is mounted in the corner of the observatory that would let us look over the top of the scope like as if a rifle scope would be looking up toward the North Star. So you can see that if the scope's aimed a little bit to the right there, then what you're looking at is an object that is kind of 
north-northeast direction. And uh, the sky is a little better off there, a little, a little bit less light dome. You can see down there in the lower right, by the way, some of the red light in the observatory. We've got the, the sky cam turned up in its night vision, so that red light in the observatory is actually shining kind of bright. So we're going to put the uh, name of this object, and it is NGC 404. NGC 404, NGC 404, and let's do a, um, a plate solve there. We're also going to go down to the title and put NGC 404 here, and this is a galaxy in uh, Andromeda, a spiral galaxy in Andromeda. Andromeda, okay. So it made a little correction here. So you can see on our screen, that squiggle you saw was the scope uh, making a correction. We're letting now the, the scope uh, settle down. It looks like it has. We were off about uh, three quarters of a degree. So let's go ahead and start live stacking now. And uh, the way we set this up is uh, our actual images, we observe at 20 second images, 20 second time exposures at 200 gain. Uh, we've got uh, nine or 10 on the live stream now. If you're watching, please let us know where you're observing from. Uh, Lisa, we already greeted there. Lisa, it's good to have you. We'll look up this object now. It's NGC 404, NGC 404, GC 404, and that's on page 313 in Stephen James O'Meara's book. 313 is an object that we would normally look at in December, so we're trying to kind of get a head start on it. NGC 404, a, oh, it's actually a dwarf lenticular galaxy, so let's change our description down there not a spiral, it's a dwarf lenticular galaxy. Dwarf lenticular galaxy, which basically means it's not spiral, it's kind of rectangular. Uh, we don't understand these lenticular galaxies much. It's in the constellation Andromeda. Um, it's just six arc minutes northwest of second magnitude uh, beta Andromeda. It's basically a condensed six arc minute round glow with a milky smooth texture and a stellar looking core and uh, has an enticingly mottled appearance as if it were breaking up into individual starlight. The view is shattered though when it becomes apparent that the mottled nature is due in part to some superimposed suns. One star lies just uh, beyond the galaxy's north flank, it's enough to make one question whether it's a supernova, so be careful. So this galaxy is highly influenced by the um, supernova that is uh, just superimposed over it. We'll bring our darks over to here, and we'll bring our mids over somewhere around in here. So we just begin to, now we'll uh, zoom in. Look at those uh, strange uh, diffraction spikes. Isn't that wild? It's because this star is so bright. Now I wonder if actually this is the galaxy we're looking at here. Yeah, this is the galaxy we're observing, and this uh, bright star here looks like it might be some kind of supernova. This is highly interesting, isn't it? I'm going to look on the... Good to have you here, Dennis from Colorado. Stu, glad to have you guys back. Glad to have you back, Stu, from New Zealand. See what you can find on this, if you could, Stu. You're always so good about looking up objects. This is NGC 404. See what you can find for us on this. Mike from Georgia, 
Uh, Dennis, so sorry, it's cloudy. Uh, Lisa, yes, we'd love to have you get your telescope out. Dark Meta, good to have you back. Uh, that star is Mirok? You're kidding. Let's, uh, let's go over to our... I don't think it would be Mirok according to this, but let's, let's do this. Let's say show chart and let's, no, we're in Andromeda, so it wouldn't be Mirok. Let's zoom in on this. Oh, well, you might be right. That is, I'm afraid that is Mirok. I take that back. Dennis, uh, you're right and I'm wrong. I did not think that would be Mirok. So NGC 404 is that um, little lenticular galaxy up there and we are being surprised by the diffraction spikes of Mirok. Look at that. See, even the image in our um, planetarium software uh, definitely comes across the same way. Let's center on this and that way it'll stop moving around. Okay, let's go back to our um, screen. You can see we're looking exactly at what we're seeing in the planetarium software. I'm gonna just uh, say here, do an, add an observation. And I'm gonna say, oh, make sure our, I'm gonna add our session. Um, let's see, here's our session on 9, we're going to say 9.14, so let's add this, and we're going to end our session on 9.15, around 1 a.m. So that would be 0, 1, and then here we're going to say a.m. at Emerald Hills. And I think this is session 86, but I'll check that to be sure here in a second. Um, let's see, Mirok was looking a bit like a supernova. Uh, distracting from the um, faint lenticular galaxy uh, NGC 404. Now notice they call this uh, galaxy, uh, the common name sometimes is Mirok's Ghost. And they, now you can see why. Uh, because as uh, Dennis pointed out accurately, this star here is Mirok, and they're saying this is its ghost. Stu says it's located seven arc minutes of second magnitude star Mirok, making it a difficult target to observe or photograph and granting its nickname Mirok's Ghost. Both the outer gas disk and its star formation are assumed to have been triggered by one or several mergers with several small galaxies roughly a billion years ago. So this is actually the object on the Herschel list, the Herschel 400. You can see several stars here that are kind of floating around it. And this is what makes it difficult in visual astronomy. If you're just looking through an eyepiece, you can see why that would have been difficult. So fascinating object. Let's go ahead and uh, take a, a snapshot of it exactly as seen. Let's see, I think we're all set. So let's change the sequencer. Let's go back to a full frame now. Let's change the sequencer to um, next target. And uh, Looks like our next target is NGC 752. So we'll uh, slew to that. And it looks like it's at about uh, 22 degrees in Andromeda, not very far away. Uh, Piratech, good to have you back. Uh, thanks for being on here from the Chicagoland area. Uh, Vito, we have you to thank for this uh, beautiful observatory that we're in tonight with the roll-off roof. We also have you to thank for the adjustable height pier that our Roe Ackerman Schmidt Astrograph 11-inch telescope is sitting on. So thank you for designing and making these 
that that we could invest in and what a wonderful uh, observatory you've done here for us. So thank you. Um, you can see right away this is a op an open cluster and I don't know if we'll have to um, image this or not but we'll go ahead and start imaging here and <clears throat> This is NGC 752, NGC 752, and down here in our title, we're going to put um, NGC 752 and open cluster in Andromeda. All right, let's get you back on the screen so you can see this. It's a beautiful open cluster. We'll just do a quick color balance here, and then we'll bring our darks up a little bit, darken up that sky a little. This is quite an open cluster. That's it. Um, a full APS-C frame. So I can't tell where this starts and where it stops. I don't know if you guys can or not. It's a huge open cluster. Yeah, Mike is saying thanks to PureTech for the great job they did on this tech, the observatory and the uh, the observatory and the adjustable height pier that the telescope mount uh, Ioptron CEM70G is sitting on top of. So uh, I'm with you, Mike. Um, friend's phone is dying next time. So sorry, Lisa. We'll catch you next time. The most up-to-date research list, 258 stars as a member of this cluster. That's a lot. This is uh, 752. Oh, Vito, thanks for liking the background music. Let us know if you think it's too loud or too soft because we don't have it set so we can hear that balance. NGC 752. We just have to go by what you guys say. 309 NGC 752 It's a bright though very large open cluster about 5 degrees south of second magnitude Gamma Andromedae. Under a dark sky it's visible with the unaided eye as a soft glow but it's a grand binocular object and in a telescope it fills the field of view. There you go. It's large and scattered with no obvious central concentration or boundaries. That's kind of what I was saying, huh? This is a better object to hunt down in binoculars. In his description of this object, of which he must have seen only a part, William Herschel notes that the cluster looks like a nebulous star to the naked eye. So even if you see this object only with your unaided eye, you have seen it as Herschel did. How about that? So it would be about, um, what would you say, Stu? I think the music is a bit quiet. Okay, we can turn that up. Um, <clears throat> it's about 12, R no, I'm sorry. Let me get back here with the right objects. About um, 75 arc minutes? Wow. So three quarters of a degree. 75 arc minutes. So we're going to start our observation here. I'm going to say this cluster is huge. 75 arc minutes. We couldn't tell where it started and where it ended. 258 stars as members. Somebody counted all those. That's pretty cool. Uh, an object that may have been NGC 752 was described by Giovanni Battista Hoderna before 1654. Uh, was perhaps described by naked eye in 1654 by Hoderna, according to Stu. Thank you, Stu. Reminds uh, Mike of the Hyades, which is also a huge cluster. It's kind of beautiful though, isn't it? It's just, it just fills the frame. It's a 
gorgeous. I, um, I guess we'll uh, save this a scene. I mean, four minutes is plenty for this cluster. Okay, let's get down to this music and let's bring this music up a little. Just gonna sneak it up one little notch and then you guys tell me how we did. I didn't move it very much at all. So tell me if that's better. Um, okay, for the next target, we'll go back over here and in our um, observing, our, our targeting and observing software, we're taking another look at the night sky and it tells us that the next object we should go to is uh, NGC 488. It's only at 13 degrees above the horizon. So let's see if that's going to be uh, enough. Uh, Stu is reminding folks to like the stream with that thumbs up button if you're enjoying it. It helps others find it and it doesn't cost you anything. Stu, thank you so much. The carbon stars in the frame. Good idea, Dennis. Uh, Vito says that helped the music. Dennis likes that volume. Stu says good now. Mike, thank you so much. I appreciate you guys helping us um, helping us zero in on that volume. Thank you. So this again is NGC 488. So we'll change these titles before I forget. NGC 488. And in the title slide, the title will say NGC 488. And that is a galaxy in Pisces. Okay, so now back to the screen. Um, I think we're ready. To, let's go ahead and do a um, a quick plate solve of this, just to make sure we're in the right spot. Uh, you guys know because you've been on the channel before. We do have 13 folks on, so maybe there's somebody new. Um, when we do this plate solve, what we're doing is we're letting the telescope take a picture of what, the, what it's seeing in the night sky and then compare it with a library of images. And then when it compares it, it figures out how far off and we were sure enough off 0.43 degrees. So that's far enough to be, um, you know, maybe way off in the frame. So then what the telescope does, uh, the mount, I should say, the mount synchronizes with, those, with the library of images. And that makes sure that we're gonna look at the object right in the middle of where we're observing. Once we get there and the telescope settles down some, then what we do is change that longer observation uh, exposure of 20 seconds. And once we do that, we start live stacking the images. And again, I've compared live stacking to um, taking picture after picture after picture and then averaging out the darks and averaging up the lights. So. When we see this first frame, it's just basically a 20 second time exposure of the sky. And this first frame is gonna pop into view right there. And then what we'll do is we'll do a quick uh, white balance of the sky that lets us kind of try to get rid of some of the uh, sky glow that we're getting from the moon tonight, which is about 82% by the way. And also some of the uh, light pollution we're getting from the city of Louisville, which is right on the horizon since we're only 13 degrees above the horizon. We're gonna try to bump up these mids and then zoom in on this galaxy, which is right there in the middle. And notice how the frame is filled with all this kind of, um, what would you call that? Confetti or, I mean, photographers would call it the grain, wouldn't you? You'd say that's the grain. So what uh, live stacking allows you to do is average out that grain because every 20 second exposure that grain looks different because it's not real it's just uh, noise in the picture uh, due to like uh, the moon glow the light pollution uh, diffraction stuff in the sky due to the atmospheric disturbance and all that confetti is just fake and the glow is sort of glistening off of it and every picture it takes is different so sharp cap 4.0, which is what we're using here, is smart enough to um, darken that those confetti pieces. And you'll see them gradually uh, become dimmer and dimmer. And then the parts of the sky that don't change, um, that part of the sky would be our stars. And 
uh, Sharp Cap is smart enough to, to say, oh, so that part he wants to see. This is NGC 488. NGC 488. And that's going to be on page 319. Um, 319. So we're over here to a December object again. NGC 488. Here we go. It's a very small but bright galaxy. It's uh, very close to Mu Piscium, Greek letter Mu. It's a good target for small telescopes, even from a suburban location. It can be seen as a small, it's just one arc minute wide, one arc minute of extent. Very condensed glow, and it can be seen even with direct vision under the light of a first quarter moon. We're looking under an 82% moon tonight. But electronically assisted astronomy lets us draw this in. This galaxy swells to about two arc minutes with averted vision. The dim halo diffusing makes it less distinct, though the core remains tight and bright. The view in a small telescope is better at low power. So again, these are difficult objects. NGC 488. Imagine Herschel, as he would be discovering these for the first time ever in history, trying to create this catalog. Bravo to him for uh, finding these objects and realizing this was not a star. So this is NGC 488 in just three minutes. And I'll tell you what let's do. Let's go over here and we'll look up NGC 488 here. And you can see that in the Mount Lemmon image, which is a 32 inch, um, 32 inch, but it was exposed for 12 and a half hours. They were able to get this image of this very same galaxy that we are looking at tonight, NGC 488. It's a 32 inch telescope and it's 12 hours plus of data we're looking at four minutes of data through an 11 inch scope here but we are seeing the very same object just not not with the same level of precision uh, so i hope that explained what noise and we also see some pixelation because we're enlarging this beyond the 100 uh, percent of our camera which our camera views at uh, 6,248 pixels by 4,176. So 6,248 by 4,176. And then what we're doing is zooming in beyond its optical precision, and we're using digital zoom. But I don't think we're getting a lot of pixelation so far in this image. Most of what you're seeing there is the noise. And in this case, it's not audio noise. It's visual noise, again, caused by the moon glow, the light pollution, and the the diffraction of the night sky. Um, Dennis says, when I was a kid, I could never have imagined this technology that we have today. Amen, Dennis, well done. Uh, Stu is saying, Mount Lemmon has taken an amazing picture, and that's the one we looked at, Stu, thank you. Um, and the speed of technology growth is exponential, right. Stu says, wait 10 years, it'll blow your mind again. Dennis says, I can't imagine. Stu says, isn't that a cool picture? Dennis says, beautiful. That's about the Mount Lemmon photo. Tightly coiled arms are so detailed. And Stu says it's like a Minecraft galaxy, right? So let's go over and make our observation here. We're gonna say, we loved the fact that we could observe this galaxy after just three minutes of um, integration. The word integration means data, um, you know, sucking in those photons into our telescope. But we loved even more the Mount Lemmon 32 inch scope's view after 12 hours of exposure. Um, still, seeing this with EAA is fun since it's real time with an 82% moon in light pollution of Louisville. 
Very good. NGC 48. Let's look for a second and see which direction. So at least you can see the sky glow is less in this image. We're looking uh, pretty much due east, I guess. And the sky glow is less there. So you can see we're not picking up quite as much sky glow. If you're wondering about this uh, image of the observatory, this is not being picked up by the scope because that's a very, very, very dim red light inside the observatory. It just lets us see the telescope view here. But that red light is very, very dim. It's just that we're using night vision with this uh, scope cam view. And that night vision doesn't have an infrared light. So it's not polluting our sky at all. Um, what you're seeing is the real deal when we come here. You can see that's a better image at seven minutes. We're starting to see not only the halo around the object, but its bright center as well. So let's snap a picture of this directly as seen. And then we'll look one more time. Nice shaders. <laughs> Thanks, Dark Meta. And then we'll change this to next image, next target. And back over here in our um, planning and observing software, which is Deep Sky Planner 8, we'll um, do another um, like refresh of the screen. And it tells us the next best object we could find is at 16 degrees above the horizon in the constellation, constellation, constellation Aries, and it's NGC 772. So let's go to that next, NGC 772. NGC 772. And we'll change that in a title slide. NGC 772, and it's a galaxy in Aries. Aries. Okay, so we'll just do a plate solve here real quick. Stu says, a distance about 90 million light years away from Earth. Now, Stu, was that uh, the last object or is that this new object, NGC 772? Maybe that was, I'm guessing that was the last object. 90 million light years is quite a hike. Imagine, we've been waiting on this light to come for 90 million light years. We were off about 0.17 degrees, so that was worth it. <coughs> Excuse me improve our model a little bit. You can see the telescope making an adjustment there. We're waiting till the scope settles. The mount, you know, moves for maybe just infinitesimally, the, just a very small amount that the mount moves for maybe uh, 15 seconds after there's any uh, motor adjustment. So we're gonna start imaging here and talking about a mount, uh, the telescope sits on top of a mount and the mount would be the black uh, metal hunk that you see sitting on top of the adjustable height pier that uh, Vito made us at PierTech. Now, immediately on top of that adjustable height pier is an eight inch pier extension, and you can see it's just a black cylinder. But above that black cylinder is a complex looking piece of machinery that has weights that go down off to the right, and then the telescope that mounts on top of it to the left. And that is the machine that's spinning around our RASA telescope, the Roe Ackerman Schmidt astrograph. That's the machine that's pointing with this, like, literally hundredth of an arc, an arc minute, hundredth, hundredth of a degree, I guess I should say, hundredth of a degree accuracy. So it's an incredibly accurate uh, Ioptron CEM70G mount. And the 11 inch telescope is riding on top of it. And by the way, on top of the scope is an outrigger setup. It's an equipment plate by Los Mandy. And we have three things mounted on that equipment plate. 
the first thing you see is a red uh, ZWOSI 178 monochrome camera. It gives us this view, the sky cam view. And the second thing you see is a pair of blue boxes. The blue box on top is the power supply for the cameras and the dew control to scare off the dew from these lenses and mirrors that we're using. And the blue box underneath is a USB controller. Both of those are by Pegasus Astro and we love them. And boy, they operate in all kinds of temperatures and they connect, you can see, on that equipment plate and uh, they drop down uh, to a rig rack that looks like this at the base of that PeerTech pier. And the rig rack has, starting from the left, an AC110 power uh, strip with a special power filtering software in it and a power distribution. And there are several plugs on the back, so all of our gear are plugged into the plugs in the back. Uh, the next thing to the right is the 12 volt power supply there at the upper, it's just a metal looking box that we kind of handmade using a, a, all of this stuff is detailed down in the uh, uh, description underneath this video. You can read more about it. There's a rig runner, uh, uh, a, a rig runner unit that distributes the 12 volt power. And then the next thing to the right is the Icron uh, Raven uh, device that converts all the data at the scope to uh, pulses that can travel digitally over uh, in, over a fiber optic cable. And this observatory is about 200 feet away from my location. I'm in an office uh, inside a building about 200 feet from the observatory. And I have the, the companion box by Raven, Icron Raven, that converts it back into data and lets our laptop here be able to see it. Let's go back now to our sky view. We've been live stacking all this time. And let's do a new color balance to make some sense out of this colorful sky. Let's uh, grab our darks and bring them back to a new black level that we'll establish with this bar. And this is kind of just a guess uh, what black level you want. I'll hold the shift key down. That lets us adjust it very, very fine with fine tuning glow and you can see our object is right here in the middle of the frame this is a galaxy in Aries it's just 16 degrees above the horizon but that's the object that we're actually looking for and this is a hundred percent of the optical view uh, this is with four minutes of exposure so far and again this is uh, NGC 772 so Stu says that was the last one. Uh, 200,000 light years in diameter, NGC 772 is twice the size of the Milky Way, surrounded by several satellite galaxies. Well, that's interesting. So who knows? This little dot right here might be a satellite galaxy of the one that we're studying here, NGC 772. It's 130 million light years away, and Dennis says the Liverpool telescope has a beautiful shot of this galaxy. Stu says uh, there's another one with the GE4 Mimi telescope. Oh, sorry, the Gemini telescope. Uh, amazing colors, colors in the Liverpool photo. Dennis says, sure glad these computers allow us to fix our typing. <laughs> Let's see what Steve O'Meara says about this object. It's uh, NGC 772. It's on page 309 of his book on the Herschel 400 list, 309. So this is a November object. And Steve O'Meara says, it's a moderately sized and somewhat bright spiral galaxy. And its core is prominent in small apertures. So you'll see it looking like a star with a very dim sheen around it. As with its phantom neighbor, M74, it's about six degrees away the southwest light pollution affects the visibility of this and we have a lot of light pollution uh, tonight uh, it's a ghostly five arc minute wide glow in a barren field ever so slightly condensed core surrounded by a weak halo 
oriented northwest to southeast. Okay. But this pale ghost glows more strongly with time and averted vision. Um, the galaxy's core is like a white egg inside of a mottled nest of light. And it tapers into a whisper of light toward the west. It has a kind of an apostrophe shape. And the southeast flank is remarkably rounded and smoothed, while the long western arm is but a slim arc of light with a slight mottled texture. So when there's not much light pollution, we could maybe see that slight mottled texture and the slim arc of light, the western arm. It has an elliptical companion, 770, just snaps into view. And Steve O'Meara is saying that it is 12.9. So I bet you anything, this is the companion. But what we'll do, again, this is NGC 7, 772. What let's do quickly is we'll go to our, um, our, uh, uh, our Starry Night Pro, which enables us to see a kind of like a planetarium view of the night sky. And the way we'll do that, I'd like to show you this just so you can kind of see if I can make it visible here for you. Uh, this is our observing software. We just right click on this and say show chart and it changes the chart and instantly cues it up. So there's NGC 772, and sure enough, NGC 770 is that one that we picked out, and we said, even before we looked here at our planetarium software, we said maybe uh, that view, boy, it's gonna, we're gonna have to center on this to keep it from drifting away. We said NGC 770 was perhaps our neighbor, and it's such a small object, there's not even a sample of it in this, planetarium software. But here you see why Steve O'Meara called it apostrophe shaped. And there's that western arm that's kind of flying out at a distance. Neat little galaxy. And it does look like it's been interacted with. I bet it was interacted with by NGC 770. And that's what's messed up this spiral arm, I bet. Um, see if you guys have said anything else. Yeah, the little galaxy is NGC 770. Good call, Dennis. Two visible supernova in the Hubble photo. Fascinating. Okay, let's go back one more time and just look at our at our view of it. Let me see if we can tease any better view of it here. With all this light pollution, I'm not sure we're going to be able to, but let's bring our mids up the most we can and see if anybody can imagine the little apostrophe shape. I think maybe this is the arm, but boy, we've got a lot of light pollution here. Keep in mind, not only do we have the light pollution because uh, of Louisville, but it's also polluted because it's at just 16 degrees above the horizon. Let's just go out and look at this NGC 772 NGC 772 Hubble and see what we've got. Oh yeah, beautiful. Look at that view. So we're gonna say, <clears throat> add observation. We were struggling <clears throat> with light pollution an 82% moon and a 16 degree above the horizon view. When we look at it with all those limitations, we have an three air masses, which is equivalent to looking through three air masses. So the normal view you'd get straight up toward the zenith 
has to be tripled when you look out toward the horizon like this. But we imagined we could still make out the apostrophe shape after just eight minutes. The Hubble view was much more inspiring. Wow. And look at all the companion galaxies, gang. Every one of these dots out here, these are all additional galaxies. It's amazing, isn't it? It's an amazing view. Thank you, Hubble. Once again, our live view, we're just barely beginning to see that western arm. Let's bring this over and darken up the sky as much as we can. But it's kind of a tightrope because the more we darken the sky, the more we're darkening the characteristics of the object. This one is deserving of some additional time. But I think if you look very carefully, you can start seeing that western arm flying out right here. We'll take an image of this as seen. And there's that companion galaxy, NGC 770, that messed it up. The tidal gravitational attraction, when it got close to this, just messed up our uh, NGC 772. And it could have happened millions of years ago. Um, NGC 770's tidal forces on the larger galaxy have likely caused the emergence of a single elongated outer spiral arm that is much more developed than the other arms. Don, good to have you here. Where are you observing from, Don? I forget. Dennis, can you imagine what the JWST could show us? Man, that would be amazing. Stu, don't need to imagine. Data, new data coming every day, right? Okay, let's go back out to the full auto view. And let's go back to our observing software. Finish this out. That'll remove this object from our list. We'll do another refresh. Uh, Deep Sky Planner calls it Run. And it picked out several other objects we might want to see. The best one looks like this open cluster, NGC 1245. So let's slew to that. NGC 1245. NGC 1245. This is an open cluster in Perseus. NGC 1245. An open cluster in Perseus. Okay, back to our screen. And uh, this is very open, isn't it? My goodness. Let's make sure we're looking at the right part of the sky here. Uh, so we'll do our plate solve. By the way, I want to thank those who chipped in last time, uh, especially uh, Larry from CCV told us he would ask his church to send the number of dollars that would be equal to the first three numbers of the next object that we observed. And the next object, I believe, was NGC 408 something. So today, uh, that draft was sent from Christ Church of the Valley in Peoria, Arizona, $408 plus the near $20, 19 dollars or whatever the peer, that uh, PeerTech sent, Vito at PeerTech, uh, meant that in last week's observation night, a uh, week ago tonight, Wednesday, $428 came in for those two Afghan families that were being kicked out of the near neighbor country to Afghanistan, and they were being, you know, expelled back into Afghanistan. And we uh, were saying that whatever came in, we would make available to them. And so that Money is ready now to be able to go to them instantly. The moment it, it was sent from the bank in Phoenix today, it'll arrive in our bank tomorrow, and uh, we'll immediately send all that. Uh, I won't keep any of that money, of course, and we'll send that to benefit these two Afghan families. If you would like to pitch in anything toward that cause, 
you could use the super chat or whatever that you see with YouTube. Uh, that's one idea. Um, and that's probably the easiest, the easiest idea is to use that super chat thing. But thank you all for just liking or subscribing. That helps get things going. Well, we're synchronized here now, and this is uh, NGC 1245, and I guess we're ready to start live stacking, but I don't think we're going to need much live stacking of this object. It looks like it's a very open cluster. Let's read about it a little bit. Stu says it's nearly a billion years old. Wow. It has 200 members, the brightest of which are 12th magnitude. Uh, it was looking really good there in that three-second exposure. NGC 1245. We'll see what uh, Stephen James O'Meara, Steve O'Meara says about it. NGC 1245. GC. Find my correct index here. Here we go. NGC 1245. He writes about it on. Well, here we go. 1245. He writes about it on page 327. 327. And. Wow, it's a relatively small, dim, but rich open cluster. It's near Alpha Persei. It uh, displays a star-like skeleton of moderately bright sun surrounded by a granular background comprising countless dim suns. Quite an interesting object. A uh, tiny packet of bright, faint suns in a starfish pattern. Little suns look like droplets of dew on a flower. Well, yeah, look at that. It is, isn't it? Uh, 40 to 50 bright suns are scattered about forming an irregular oval with loose arms. An irregular oval of loose arms. How about that? An irregular oval of loose arms. Um, 1245. Core at a glance has an east to west oriented river of about eight similarly bright suns running along the northern border. Uh huh. You see those? See these, uh, these eight suns here all in a row. And Steve O'Meara pointed those out for us. Well done, Steve. Thank you. Um, granular texture is most apparent between the cluster's two brightest stars. Here you can see the two brightest stars. The cluster has some 200 members of 12th magnitude and fainter, packed in an area only 10 arc minutes of extent. It's a fine spectacle in larger telescopes. Wow, that's fun, isn't it? 1245. Uh, using EAA with this scope, it would definitely be considered a large scope because we're not only getting the benefit of the 11 inch telescope, but we're also getting the benefit of the uh, multiple time exposures stacked on top of each other. That's a beautiful cluster, isn't it? Okay, so that's just three minutes of integration and we're ready to move on. NGC 1245. Um, awesome. Stu, thanks for the way you help us, you know, chronicle these things and this becomes a part of the live stream. So if you're watching this by recording, Stu and the others are helping as well. Let's go to the next target now and uh, do an observation of this 1245. Add observation. I'm going to say... Um, 200 or so members, beautiful little cluster in a tight format, um, row of eight stars in a line, two brightest members, uh, 
Boy, how do you describe that? Hundreds of points of light. Something like that. When we click that observation in, it removes it from our list. Do we know what size telescope Caldwell used to make his list? The Caldwell list, um, remember, uh, it was actually made by, Caldwell was his middle name, Sir, mm, his name, name is not actually Caldwell. Caldwell list made by Sir, um, Sir Patrick Moore, yeah, Sir Patrick Moore. And he did it sitting down one night at a desk. You know, he had just observed so much from various telescopes that he did it one night just sitting at a desk. So that's the Caldwell list. We're using the Herschel list, Herschel 400. And that's what, uh, that's this list. And Herschel used, if I remember right, that was an 18 inch telescope, but it was an 18 inch telescope of its time, which was what? Was it in the 1780s? I forget. And so that 18 inch scope, they say, would roughly be equivalent to today's, you know, 10 or 11 inch scope. And boy, that was a 30 foot long telescope, I think. It was huge in the day. So we're really fortunate to have uh, our scopes because, you know, they're much more compact than his 18 inch and we, they, they don't have to be this unwieldy 32 foot long deal. It's just a completely different uh, day, isn't it? So look at this uh, beautiful, there's no synchronization needed. We were five thousandth of a degree within accuracy that time. So now our mount has assembled a uh, nice enough view of the night sky and also we're um, probably close enough to the last object that we didn't move that much I'm guessing too. So here's this image in the middle. It is, uh, the object is NGC 1342. So we're going to change our NGC 1342 up there and then also down here in our title slide, NGC 1342, and it's an open cluster, also in Perseus. It's beautiful, beautiful little cluster. Again, we're gonna do a color balance. We'll move our blacks over to make, essentially what we're doing is defining for the picture, for sharp cap, we're saying, make this your new threshold of black. And then we sort of increase the mid colors and sharp cap says, okay, I think I understand. You wanna see that object there in the middle and you want me to highlight it. Boy, that's a beautiful, beautiful cluster. Amazing, and lots, lots of different colors. Moore uses other surname Caldwell to list the, to name the list since the initial of Moore is already used for the Messier catalog, right? Kimberly, good to have you here. Welcome. Uh, Stu says that uh, Sir Patrick Moore had a 12.5 inch scope. Awesome, Stu. Uh, Okay, so this is 12, I'm sorry, 1342. NGC 1342 is on page 323, 323. 1342. And Steve O'Meara writes, it's a fairly bright, though loosely packed and scattered open cluster. Um, he says, jagged, 10 minute, 10 arc minute long line of some, oh, half a dozen suns. What? Did we not slew to a different location? How can this be? Because we're in the same, look, we're in the same 
plus jointly. 1342, is it that close? Are they in the same field of view? This is a mystery. 1342, let's, um, let's cue this up to our star chart, our planetarium software, and there's 1342. Thirteen forty two. Thirteen forty. Let me zoom in here a little bit better. Thirteen. I keep wanting to. We use the select other here. Thirteen forty two. There we go. And what was the last cluster we saw? Gotten it now. Um, we're still looking in to see 1245. Yeah, I think you're right. So we evidently didn't slew to the new object. We just skipped right past that. So we're going to go back to our plane software and say slew to that. I think you're right. Yeah. One thing we didn't do. No wonder it was so accurate. <laughs> Okay, so now we're slewing over. 1342 has an apparent size of 17 minutes, apparent magnitude 6.7, marginally visible to the naked eye. Awesome. And there it is. Right there. So now we'll start imaging. And let that come up. <clears throat> now let's see. Let's go back to 1342 again. 1342, I think it was on page 3. 1342, where was it? Thirteen forty-two. Uh, it's a jagged 10 minute long line of some half a dozen suns of mixed magnitudes shine brightly against an oval haze of dim suns. Okay, so we'll color balance this. Establish our new line. This is 13 degrees above the horizon. Establish our new line of black. So what we did there is we just basically said ignore all that other um, moonlight and all this light pollution. And we told SharpCap, redefine a new level of black. And it did. And then out of that black, it's now trying to determine these stars. So it's, now this must be the line of stars yeah, this is the line of stars that Steve O'Meara is talking about. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So there are the ten stars that he observed. And then he said, um, the background haze scintillates with averted vision, clusters two dozen or so brightest stars form a sideways broken T against a fuzzy drop. A sideways broken T. Okay, so I'll let you sort that out. Um, the cluster contains nearly 100 members of eighth magnitude and fainter. 100 members, eighth magnitude. Redefine a new level of black. <laughs> Pain advertisement. Okay, so we're going to go over here and do an observation of this. Let's say about 100 members of 8th magnitude and dimmer, according to Steve O'Meara. Uh, cool 
line of 10 stars in a row. You see 1342. So these stars are traveling together as a group. And what separates them from a, what's the difference between a cluster and a galaxy? Well, you have clusters that are in galaxies like the Milky Way. The Milky Way is 100 light years across. This cluster might be made up of stars that are maybe only you know, who knows, four light years across or something. Um, the Milky Way has lots of dust and uh, gases, whereas these open clusters, because they're traveling through the interstellar space together, they uh, blow off all their gases and then all we get are just the stars in this loose grouping. These open clusters are kind of uh, rotating around with the arms in our in our galaxy and beyond, but uh, the Milky Way is traveling as a disk, for instance. So uh, kind of related because it does represent a lot of heavenly objects that are traveling together, but definitely different. Lots of clusters in our galaxy than lots of galaxies in the universe. So kind of a question of hierarchy. Let's do a picture of this at four minutes. It's plenty plenty to be able to see it. Now Steve O'Meara talked about uh, quite a bit of um, haze that you would start picking up in a dark sky. And I don't think we're going to stay on this object long enough tonight to be able to see that haze. But if we stayed on it long enough, it would begin to look like, have you ever seen the Pleiades uh, M, what is that, 45? You can pick up that haze in no time at all in the Pleiades. And that's kind of what he's talking about. There is a bit of nebulosity traveling with these stars that will presumably eventually all blow off with them. So pretty interesting, pretty interesting group. Omira had a good imagination. Guess you have to when you only have a four inch telescope. Right, Stu. Cluster doesn't have a black hole in the middle. That's exactly correct too. There really is no core to a cluster. It's just a, a club of stars that were probably either created around the same time or picked up stars as they were traveling and now they're just traveling together through space and usually affiliated with a galaxy, although they wouldn't have to be. They could be traveling through interstellar space. Okay, uh, let's see. The next object that we pick up here is NGC 1513. Let's stop our imaging run and just go back to shorter exposures for the next target. and. Uh, the next object that Herschel uh, makes available to us is at 16 degrees above the horizon. It's NGC 1513. So we'll slew to that, NGC 1513. NGC 1513. And in the title NGC 1513 and it's an open cluster also in Perseus. Oh, this one's really low. I'm not sure we're going to be able to catch this tonight. See that big black scary looking shadowy thing. That's the tree line in this part of the sky. But look, you can barely make out the cluster right there through the trees. But boy, the trees are um, fighting enough. I don't think we're going to count that as the observation, are we? It's just not, not really fair enough. Um, I wonder if our view, although it looks like this object is rising. So you can see which way the scope. Yeah, we're in the east, so it is rising, but boy, it's just ugly through those trees, isn't it? But you can also make it out, can't you? How interesting. So let's take a look at this in our chart. 
um, NGC 1513. Let's go to our planetarium software. Show chart. Yeah, that's what we're seeing. That little round, that little round circlet of stars. Whoops, I got off of it. Show chart. There we go. That's what we're seeing there. So I'll let you guys decide, is this a good enough? It is, isn't it? We're seeing the whole object here. What do you think? Wahaj, good to have you here, Wahaj. Space Daddy greetings. <laughs> Stu says that's a great name for Doug. <laughs> Stu, you rascal. Uh, Stu says NGC 1513 doesn't exist in Wikipedia. Must be that nondescript. NGC 1513. Let's see what um, the planetarium software had for it. Just says it's an open cluster, but it's all generic data. So you're right, it's very nondescript, isn't it? I think we're going to count this as our observation, because look, it's, it is beautiful. Let's go ahead and live stack it for a minute and see what we get. Uh, start imaging. Wahaj, good to see you. How do I say your name? Wahaj, Wahaj. Wahaj Jawai. Assalamu alaikum. Um, maybe, maybe tell us uh, some kind of phonetic pronunciation of your name if you don't mind because we want to get it right. Oh my goodness. Look at this. Look at what live stacking does. So we're going to do a color balance. Live stacking is amazing. We're going to reset our black level. And we're going to wait for... We're going to wait for um, that green to come out. But look, that's a beautiful, it's a beautiful view of this open cluster. It's amazing. Let's just see what Steve O'Meara had to say about that. It's um, NGC 1513. <clears throat> and Stephen writes about it on 327 in his book. NGC 1513. It's a rather dim and loose open cluster. And it's a very rich part of the Milky Way. The brightest part consists of it's at first only a dim glow, but with averted vision, again visually. The cluster's brighter members pop in and out of view, forming a semicolon of twinkling starlight. Semicolon. Um, against a uniform background glow. It's a circlet of about a dozen eleventh magnitude and fainter suns that look like a mix of salt and pepper with averted vision. Only about 50 members. I like the, uh, you know, the circlet idea. Let's go back here and let's say, Omira said around 50 members see the circlet of a dozen stars. This was just 15 degrees above the horizon, but live stacking made it beautiful in just two minutes and 40 seconds. It's amazing. NGC 1513. Okay, so we're going to snap a picture of this. One last look at what you guys are saying about it. Um, 
Alaikum salam. <laughs> You're very kind. Waj. Uh, pronounce the J. Oh, Wahaj. Wahaj, got it. Uh, any comments on James Webb Discoveries? Has it changed past academia or space? You know, Stu in the comments might have some um, comments on that. I have been following the pictures, but I haven't looked at the ways that it might be changing what we're focusing on more so instead of on the James Webb Discoveries is just the Herschel 400 list. So as a result, uh, we're kind of our head down, just focused on that list. But I bet Stu can tell us he's been following the James Webb. Okay, so we're going to put these in order by best view. And again, all of these objects are very low. Let's go to this one that's 18 degrees above the horizon. It's NGC 1545. NGC 1545. NGC 1545. I think our scope stayed in roughly the same orientation. NGC 1545. And it's an open cluster again in Perseus. We are seeing some trees here to the right, aren't we? See that big tree there? But honestly, I think this cluster is maybe right there. So let's go ahead and um, stack this and just play with it for a minute. And we're going to see what Omer says about it. This is 1545. It's probably in the same field of view. I bet. Um, I'm going to have to put in a permanent index marker on this index back here. 1545. Those are just galaxies. Get to the right index. 1545 and 328. He says, um, a clear pattern of a dozen suns That's amazing the way it's pulling it out of those trees, isn't it? That's remarkable. <laughs> it's seen through those trees. 1545. Uh, what appears to be a close pair of stars to the south is actually a tight triangle of suns. Yeah, you can see the triangle, which lies at the center of a five-pointed star-shaped pentagon, pentagram. So here's one, two, three or three, depending on whether you want to go here, four, five. Maybe here is what he means. Um, about a dozen tenth and eleventh magnitude suns, many of which are in pairs. These stars are only the first tier of bright stars can be seen in small telescopes. It's amazing how many stars suddenly appear with averted vision. Pentagram appears to be surrounded by a ghostly mist that wafts in and out. Imaginary pentacles surrounding the pentagram. By alternating between averted and direct gazes, the cluster's crisp background stars seem to appear and disappear like lights blinking on a Christmas tree. Seen another way, the stars look like the stick figure of a man running. Okay, so these might be the legs, and this is his body. The cluster contains 65 members, ninth magnitude and fainter. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and say here, we enjoyed <coughs> this object at just uh, 19 degrees 
above the horizon, but mixed in with a tree in our field of view. And sharp cap still live stacked it so we could make out five pointed pentagram or running man that Omira described. You know, it's just kind of fun to see that you can do this through all those trees and everything else. Um, Stu, JWC has changed the whole thinking on the Big Bang, apparently. Dennis, we should get Doug a chainsaw for Christmas. Those trees keep getting in the way. I love that idea. <laughs> uh, Stu says, absolutely, laugh out loud. Well, Hodge, Stu sure has. I wonder what else we had been not quite a, quite sure about. Stu, uh, Steve Amira, if you squint, you can see more. <laughs> well, Hodge, the hangman or stick body. Stu, probably everything, Lodge. I was afraid you would say that, Stu. So got this uh, cross conversation talking about the uh, JWST. We'll have to do a special night on the JWST. That'd be a fun thing to do. I tell you, we'll probably be ready for that soon because we will reach a point at which at 10 p.m. there won't be a lot of objects that we can see until we get to a new season. And as you guys know, we're kind of pushing it already. There, we're kind of coming out of the tree so you can see, kind of beginning to, this is the top of the tree in this case, kind of leaving the tree behind. And there's the running man. Fascinating. All right, back to our um, <clears throat> planning and observing software. Let's refresh the list. Notice this best column says, you still shouldn't be looking at these. These are still miserably low on the horizon. Uh, but let's go ahead and try another one here. Here's a 15.7 degree high object and a 15.8. Let's go to NGC 584. NGC 584, and that's in Perseus, it's a galaxy. NGC 584, NGC 584, and this is a galaxy in Cetus. Is that just C E T G C 584 a galaxy in Cetus. I think it's just C E T U S, isn't it? Cetus. For some reason, um, it feels like it's the whale. Let's um, show chart. You see 584, 586, and 596 are all in the same field of view. 584, 596. We can do both of those in the same field of view, I, I hope. Anyway, let's back off and look at Cetus. Yes, C-E-T-U-S. I think it's a whale. Look how low it is on the horizon in the east-southeast. Okay, so back to our sky. We were 0.8 degrees off, so there was enough slewing. Um, Stu says, move to the southern hemisphere for a while, Doug. Whole new sky down there. Azrae, don't forget to give a like to this video. Very kind, Azrae. Thank you for, for recommending that. You are very kind. All right, so we'll now um, start live stacking. And get the 
these 20 second exposures in. This is uh, MGC 584. Stu, what can you tell us about this Galaxy 584? 584 is on page 305. 305. Stunningly small, deceivingly bright, lens-shaped galaxy. Hmm. Stunningly small, deceivingly bright, lens-shaped galaxy. What I'm going to do here is do the deep sky image annotation. There's 584 right in the middle. Now that's where we want to look, right here. I would say that is stunningly small. We're at 188% uh, of our camera's field of view. Let's bring back a little bit of the night sky here and try to bring in a little bit more mids. Stunningly small, deceivingly bright, lens-shaped galaxy. Find example how a tiny galaxy with a moderately faint listed magnitude, 10.4 magnitude, is quite easy, quite easy to see. I have glimpsed it at the limit of vision in an antique one and a quarter inch telescope under a dark sky. It's a beautiful object in all larger telescopes. Um, it's almost a stellar smear of light in small scopes. It's so small and its core is so bright and a, it has a stellar, so bright and stellar that the system is easy to sweep over. The galaxy's fuzzy nature shows up better as you increase power. Um, it's an extremely sharp core and egg-shaped inner lens and a strong and equally sharp needle of light that slices through the major axis of the outer lens, which we can't see yet, fades to insignificance under higher powers. Non-interacting galaxy has a list of magnitude of 13.2, but that must be an error by magnitude or more. So that's 584. Boy, I don't know, guys. That us at three minutes not a lot we can see yet but granted it's just three minutes um, Stu says NGC 584 belongs to the NGC 584 galaxy group which also includes the galaxies NGC 596 NGC 600 NGC 615 and NGC 636 so there you go <laughs> 60 million light years away Stu says, you're not squinting enough. <laughs> I agree, man. We just need a little more time on this object, apparently. Man, I don't know. NGC 584. NGC, NGC 584. Okay, that's basically what we're seeing. This is a bigger picture of what we're seeing. A hazy glow around a brighter core. So this outer glow, how far away is this to 60 million light years? Um, this outer glow, do you think those are individual stars or do you think that's dust? I don't know. Maybe a mixture? Stars and dust? Anyway, look back at our image and that's just a smaller version. Here's Hubble. 
and live. Hubble and live. Do I sound like an eye doctor? Hubble and live. So really our live view just is a little bit smaller, but it's basically the same thing. Okay, so let's save this exactly as seen. It's five minutes of integration. Now, how will we know how to find 596? We're on 584 right now. 584. So 590, by the way, 586 is very close. But I don't think that's in the Hubble list. <clears throat> it is not. But 596 is, and 600 is not. Did I say Hubble list? I mean the Herschel, the Herschel 400 list. So let's figure out how we can find 596. Well, the easy way is just to use, um, let's go back out to uh, a wider view, and let's just use star annotation, deep sky annotation again. 596 is right here. So this is 596. Another just spherical looking glow. They just look like stars, don't they, Stu? But for some reason, Herschel saw this and knew enough to, okay, so on 584, we're going to say, uh, add observation. An oval glow around a brighter core. And then for 580, 596, we're going to say, less oval glow around less bright core. Companion to NGC 584. So here we're going to say 584 dash 596 and then save as seen. And it's like a two for one special. All right, good stuff. We're making good progress. Um, let's go back out to auto and switch to next target. Come back over and do a refresh and see what we have. Here's a 16 degree object, NGC 615. So that was probably what, 584? Was that 596? That was discovered on the September 10th. 1784. You could tell it's a ga galaxy even back then. Yeah, that is amazing. 615. So this next object is going to be NGC. Six fifteen NGC six fifteen, and this is a galaxy in another galaxy in Cetus. But 
this is not part, oh, it is part of the 584 group. According to Stu's grouping, Dennis said he'd love to have the skies of the 1700s now. Even the skies of the 1950s would be better. You're right. So we're going to start imaging here. This is going to be NGC 615. Almost sounds like 615. It's supper time or something. NGC 615. This is just at 16 degrees above the horizon, so anybody's guess whether there's a tall tree there. New black level right <clears throat> there. And look, I bet it's right there in the middle. Yep. 615, we've also got oh, 600 to 596 up there. And there's 060 or 607. This is another blob. This is 615. Page 305. A tiny fleck of elongated light with a star-like core. Yeah, that's a pretty good description. It's only one arc minute in length. Appears elongated, surrounded by a slightly dimmer halo that extends by a factor of two, especially with averted vision. Excuse me, Herschel, you were amazing. How in the world you could do this back in the late 1700s, I don't know. I mean, it looks like any other star at that point, doesn't it? Just what we need, more lights. A satellite the size of a squash court was launched last week, predicted to become the brightest object in the night sky after the moon, brighter than the ISS. Which satellite was that, Stu? ESA on Ariane, Ariane 5. This looks like it could be Saturn. Saturn shaped object. Extremely tiny, but visible. Okay, it sweeps it away, and we're going to save a scene right there. It is for better, for worse, NGC 615. Amazing. Okay, we're going to refresh this list. And now we have a, um, an object 15 degrees above the horizon. It's NGC 247. Thank you, Dennis. Two forty seven NGC two forty seven NGC two forty seven. 
and it is a galaxy also in Cetus. Cetus has its share of galaxies, doesn't it? Let's back off. And just real quick. NGC 615 is uh, 70 million light years from Earth, 75,000 light years across, and a black screen for us. <laughs> That's stupid. That's so unfair, isn't it? I'm wondering if once we get, well, there's 247. Look at that. 247b, 247d, it has two companion galaxies out there. This is a huge galaxy, isn't it? Um, 247, page 299, fairly bright, almost edge-on galaxy, it's anemic, an anemic 15-minute elongated glow oriented north to south. So what we'll do is we'll color balance. Establish that new black line. Boy. It is anemic. Um, Extensions swell and contract with averted and direct vision. Patchiness, a bright bead at the core of the nuclear region. Do you think it's really going to be there? It's um, fifteen arc minutes wide. The Claw Galaxy, 11 million light years away, much closer than the last ones. NGC 247. The Claw Galaxy. We couldn't see it at all in the three second exposure. Very dim. Still not seeing it. <clears throat> Dropped in for a quick view from Florida. Hope all is well. Sadly, going on five weeks of clouds. Glad to see someone else view. Papa Tech, so sorry. Dennis, I've seen a magnitude 9.9, .9, but absolute magnitude 19.57. <coughs> One of several galaxies gravitationally bound, a sculpture galaxy, NGC 2553. One of the closest, the nearest groups of galaxies to the Milky Way. <coughs> Are you guys starting to see this little cloud here in the middle? Yikes, I just dripped water on Stephen James O'Meara. So sorry, Steve. Please forgive me. Of course, if I was outside under the night sky, I'd be dripping dew on your book anyway. <coughs> Let's pump up these mids and see if that 
boy. See that glow there? How about that? Mike says, I see it. Anemic is right. <laughs> Papa Tech, you made me feel better. No more complaining about smoke. It is anemic. How did Herschel ever see this? He must have had darker skies in Bath or wherever he was looking. Bath, England is where he started, I think. Excuse me. We're in our last 14 minutes. Wow, this galaxy is starting to emerge, but boy, I would have never believed it in the beginning. Fuzzy. His candles weren't very bright, Doug. I think you're right, Dennis. <clears throat> that night sky must have been amazing for Mr. Herschel and Caroline. But I also think they must have just been very determined. They must have had, I think they made like 18 telescopes in their time. Tell you what, this is amazing. This has got to be one of the most amazing things ever. How did he ever see this? Anemic, elongated glow. Magnitude 8.9, but A lot more time on their hands. That's very possible too. <clears throat> wow, this is six minutes. Let's go look at this. Let's see, NGC 247. So you see why it's just a faint glow? Because that's all this is. This is the presumably the Hubble view. And just look at it, it's just a million tiny points of light. It's the central region of a spiral galaxy known as NGC 247, relatively small spiral galaxy in uh, Cetus the Whale, 11 million light years from us. Part of the Sculptor Group. Bright whitish patch surrounded by a mixture of stars, gas, and dust. Now there's a void there in the upper right. Look at that. It's like the dust is cleared out from that region. And it might continue to clear out as the thousands of years go on. It's amazing. wide field imager, 2.2 um, meter telescope in La Silla Observatory. And 
and this is what we're looking at. Now I'm seeing a glow there, how about you guys? But boy, it's just a glow. Wikipedia view is better. <laughs> okay, let's go to the Wikipedia view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the one we got to. It's a 2.2 meter telescope. Eleven million light years away from away from us. Okay. Well, let's uh, save a scene. Nine minutes, kind of our limit. But this is just a a ghostly glow. We would perhaps never have noticed this. Herschel has our deep respect. All right, let's uh, refresh and see if we got time for one more object here. Looks like there's a um, 779. I wonder if that's in the same field view. Let's back off and use our deep sky image annotation. Nope, nothing else in this field. Seven seven nine. This will be our last object of the night. Whoops, I slewed to seven twenty instead. Let's go to seven seven nine. Slew to seven seven nine. Just a little adjustment there. Not much of a core. One of the closest galaxies to us. I would never have noticed it, right? Okay. Last object of the night, gang. A plate solve here just to make sure we can use deep sky annotation. Um, 0.15 degrees off, so we'll let it do that tiny correction. Right, as soon as it settles back down. Okay, I think that should be good. Start imaging. Blame NASA, they're trying to launch Artemis. GC seven 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 nine. We must be right at the moon. <clears throat> um, seven seven nine. It's a galaxy in C 
Cetus also. A light color balance. Yeah, this has changed because we're looking in the vicinity of the moon. Find that new black level. Something like that. Bring up the mids. Ah, I think we're seeing it right here in the middle. Man, Herschel has our deepest respect, right? How did he ever pick that out? Okay, so you guys are talking about Starlink satellites and space shuttle launches. What can you tell us about 779, Stu? See what Steve O'Meara says about it. <clears throat> see. 779306 779 very dim small um, small two arc minute wide long cloud of light elongated north to north west to north northwest to south southeast at 72, the galaxy is quite nice, having a highly condensed oval core surrounded by uniformly bright ellipses, uh, ellipse of light. Still, the ga galaxy is tiny. <coughs> well, we're starting to see that something is there at least, aren't we? But still very tiny. NGC 779 is super tiny. Omira is right. But we could still detect a faint oval glow after just three minutes. 779. That is really small, yep, for sure. Well, I want to thank you once again for spending this time with us. This is a challenging list, make no mistake. If we wanted an easier list, we would do the Messier list. The next level up, we would do the Caldwell list. But this is the more even advanced list, the Herschel 400. And uh, many of the objects are just like this. There's a bright core that looks star-like, but you have to work to tease that haze in. We're just starting to see it now so that this looks oval. If you've already subscribed to the channel, thank you very much for doing that. That gets the channel up in other people's views when they search. Whether you've subscribed or not, whether you're watching live or not, we would just appreciate it so much if you click the thumbs up. Again, that helps elevate the channel for others, but it doesn't cost you a dime. Uh, if you like content like this, please click the thumbs up. If you don't like content, then don't feel free. Don't feel forced to do it. Um, we love it when you come by. This is a much more <clears throat> interactive way to do astronomy than the old way that I used to try to do back in year 2000 for a few months. Sitting out there by myself in the cold, in the dark, spooky, noises, things went bump in the night. And I was looking through an eyepiece and I could never see stuff like this. Electronically assisted astronomy rocks. And I would encourage you to try it if you haven't done it already. That's it for tonight. We do two hour live streams whenever it's clear, at least once a week. And we'll look forward to seeing you again. We're working our way through the Herschel list. You can always go to emeraldhillskies.com and look under resources. And we'll catch up that spreadsheet so you can see how we're doing. I guess I could just click one button here. All I have to do is go to observed and 
clear the just have to clear the criterion that says only show us observed and say ignore it. And once we rerun this list, we'll see that we now are only 138 objects left to go. Woohoo! 138 left to go. Wait, that can't be right. Let me ignore the horizon too. Now let's refresh again. Oh, we got to say observed not. Now let's refresh. 170. 170 objects left to go out of 402. Thank you for sticking with us. Thanks so much for uh, spending this time. And we always like to thank God for making all these cool objects that we can go look at. Hope you have a great evening, a great rest of your week. Thanks to all our folks that were on. Dennis, you're kind to say thanks. Papa Tech, uh, appreciate you encouraging. Stu, thank you as always for pitching in all these facts. Mike, you were first tonight. Azra, have a great night. Uh, Stu, you're very kind. It's much more comfortable than being out there and the swatting the mosquitoes or the, or the cold winter skies as well. We love this. Stop back with us again and we'll see you then. God bless. Have a great evening.